inviting me to come participate in this event. I think it's uh, an important opportunity <coughs> to uh, get some information out, which has unfortunately been all too hidden or uh, unavailable. And I, I really want to thank Arnie Gunderson for the work that you've done. Uh, it's certainly very interesting because I can tell you that when I became involved in this case, the case of the accident at Three Mile Island in 1979. Uh, I, at the beginning, only knew what I had read in the newspapers and to some degree in scientific journals. And they were based on the sorts of data that Arnie has shared, had just shared with us from the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and from the utility. And based on that information and the uh, estimates of, about where people were and uh, where the radiation plumes went, um, it was widely uh, promulgated, the information, that the maximum dose that anyone in the general public could have received, the maximum radiation dose, was much less than the average annual background radiation exposure that we have normally, uh, <clears throat> that any of us would have. And it's important to remember that we're all exposed to ionizing radiation every day. This is a, 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 a universal uh, exposure. Um, but then I began to be exposed to some alternative information from people uh, who had been in this area at the time of the accident. So those of you who are historians or journalists and you're looking into, uh, if you're interested in what happened here, I, I really encourage you to talk to people who were here at the time. Um, and I want to start in terms of the, the slides here with a few photographs that were made by Robert Del Tredici. And, and Bob is here today. Uh, I just want to recognize Bob because he's done some really great work. Bob came in the summer of 1979 for the first time to Three Mile in May. Okay, May. So the spring, short, shortly after the accident. So, so what I want you to see, because I think it's very important to understanding what happened at the time, uh, what it looked like here, because some of you uh, here weren't born then, and uh, others may not know uh, what the area was like at the time, because this area has grown so much since 1979. And so he here's the Susquehanna River and through my island, and I think it's, it's really clear that this was a very agricultural area. Uh, and it's important because um, this is a conserv this was a conservative culture. Uh, not a lot of people with higher degrees and professional experience. Um, and, and this is important because people who reported uh, symptoms, which I'll, I'll go into more later, symptoms uh, that they experienced during the time of the accident were Many people were told that it was impossible that they, would, because not enough radiation was released, to cause any acute symptoms, uh, which was known. And uh, furthermore, if they continued with such reports, uh, that this could be a sign of mental instability. And Keep in mind now that these are, are not, you know, not in general people who are accustomed to going up against public officials uh, or who would necessarily have experience with lawyers and uh, strong capacity to advocate for themselves in comparison to some uh, more privileged populations um, that, that are in this area too. So Dr. to go... May I yes. say in the first slide, at the very bottom, in that foreground, are buried some of the first farmers from the 1700s in the area. So there's a cemetery there. It's crumbling, but it's there. And 
from the early 1700s. I never knew that. So this area has a long history of farming. There was a farm on That's right. On the island itself. On the island. There's still Before. ruins of the farm there. Is that right? They, and they found graves on the island. And they were my ancestors, the grooms of Catholic, who grew the best melons in the area because of the flood came. And with one of the last floods were so seriously, you know, just destroyed so much of the property that they gave up melon farming and sold to utilities. And from there, we have the story. Mm. So the melons led to the placement of the nuclear reactors. They would continue growing the best melons. Wow. They would not be here today. That's, that's a real um, difference of power there. Melons versus reactors. Well, uh, just, I want to share with you a few more of Bob's photographs from May of 1979 because I think they give us a sense of um, how close people in this area were, some people were, uh, to the reactors. Meadow Lane. Meadow Lane, Bob. Please, if, I mean, I've never been able to show Bob's pictures with him present, so any narration <coughs> that you can share with us would... Uh, Bob, could you say something about this photograph? The Lemondary Township on a nice spring day with a symbol of wind power on the left and fossil fuel in the boat on the right and nuclear in the middle with a defunct basketball net. Uh, but <laughs> and a child, child is still and there. a child in the middle of it all. That's right there too. Uh, that's uh, uh, also London Dairy Township. Uh, right up, up 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 from Meadow Lane. I think it's Zion Road. That's where that is. And that's just this farm. It's right, right there. It speaks for itself. So uh, one of the uh, types of reports, and, and these reports came from many, many people were, uh, who were farmers, were uh, <coughs> problems with their farm animals. Uh, things ranging from miscarriage to uh, deaths and so on of farm animals, as well as pets all kinds of arthritic conditions and blindness and other things like that. Many, many... Uh, Difficulty giving the birth, right. cesarean sections mm -hmm. necessary. Right. So Bob is uh, recounting to us some of what he heard in interviews from this time. You are. Yeah, you are. And Bob, could you tell That's us... From the top of Fry Village, the retirement home, um, from the roof, the highest point in Little Town. You have to talk to Mary Olson about the abundance or, of trees and the difference today. But that's what it looked like in the spring of 79. So I want you to think about what you heard from Arnie Gunderson as you look at this photograph. Uh, because this gives you a picture that you can think about in terms of the, the plumes of emissions. And I think when we, when we think about plumes, we might thinking, think of something that's present at a, a single point in time. But as also is very clear from uh, what Arnie shared with us, uh, the emissions were not constant. They changed over time. Uh, so the source of the plume, the, the quantity of radioactive materials coming from the plant changed over time. Of course, the winds changed some, but very importantly, the, uh, there was a temperature inversion at the time. This was very unusual uh, weather here in this region. Uh, and it, this has been very well documented uh, and reported in the Journal of Weather, which is the, the journal of the Royal Meteorological Society, uh, just several years ago by Dr. Bergainer and his co-author. Um, a very detailed analysis of the weather patterns uh, at this, during the, these days, these four days, generally referred to as the four days of the accident. Um, but 
the plumes because of the weather conditions rather than uh, blowing out. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen smoke coming from a chimney at a time when you can see a, you can actually see the smoke traveling some distance from the chimney. Uh, at other times, you can't see it even a yard away from the from the chimney because of a very rapid dispersion. But this, these were the weather conditions that were conducive to make whatever came out. Uh, and and by the way, let's be clear. There's never been any question about whether there were releases. That's been, and everyone has always agreed that there were radiation releases during this accident. The questions have been about the, the amount of releases. But the weather conditions are very important because um, Arnie's work is about the condition of the reactor and the amount of radiation that comes out of the reactors. But that's not what determines people's exposures. What, what determines that it's in part of what determines, but also there's the transport. So uh, if you think of these narrow plumes, uh, they could have hit part of Middletown and not other parts. Um, so in the early 1990s, I uh, met Norman and Marjorie Ahmed, who were working uh, in, on the same lawsuits that Arnie was involved in. And they shared with me numerous affidavits and um, other testimony from residents, some of uh, which was taken in a survey that Marjorie Palmer did along with Mary Osborne and others um, that describe in detail what people's experiences were during the accident. Some of these were people, people who were talking who said they didn't know yet about the accident. Uh, it was the first day in general uh, when they experienced the, the symptoms that they, they talk about. Uh, but this, this had a big uh, impact on me because uh, I wondered, well, how can we understand uh, what people report? And I'd like to